Good afternoon and welcome to Today on Bay TV. We are live in Swansea on Tuesday the 23rd of May 2017. I'm Henry Darby Cook and this is Gaynor Morgan. Today's show is going to be a little bit different as we look at the events that happened last night in Manchester. And today, of course, the people of Manchester are very much in our hearts and minds and we're thinking about all the people of Manchester and perhaps celebrating those who helped others in the time of need. We've been joined this morning by Rob Stewart, leader of the Swansea Council, and of course by Robert Clellan Jones. Henry, I think we're going to go we on Manchester. We're going to start the show with uh, our Prime Minister's statement, Theresa May. We offer our thoughts and prayers to the family and friends of those affected. We offer our full support to the authorities, the emergency and the security services as they go about their work. And we all, every single one of us, stand with the people of Manchester at this terrible time. And today, let us remember those who died and let us celebrate those who helped, safe in the knowledge that the terrorists will never win and our values our country and our way of life will always prevail. A day we all hoped we'd never see, Rob. Uh, our hearts go out to the people there. Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's uh, unfortunately becoming too regular an occurrence now uh, across the world where we find um, often uh, random individuals um, intent on causing death and destruction uh, in places where people have congregated. You know, we've had attacks in France and other places in Europe. Um, it's been a, a while since we've had such a big attack in the UK. Um, but again, you know, I woke up this morning to, to, to hear the news like everybody else and, uh, you know, 22 people lost their lives last night in Manchester, many of them young children and young people who'd been enjoying Aria Grande, Ariana Grande's concert. And, uh, you know, awful, but I mean, it's it's one of those things that's, uh, unfortunately, we've got to be vigilant. Um, you know, a city like Swansea is not immune from this sort of threat. We we know that. And, uh, you know, we send our hearts and our, our thoughts to the people of Manchester. I will, I'll be writing to Andy Burnham and, and the leader of Manchester Council on behalf of the city uh, to offer them our solidarity and our best wishes. And, uh, you know, we'll be in, uh, having a vigil in Castle Square this evening at six o'clock to remember those victims of the attack. Robert Llewellyn Jones, it rather harks back, doesn't it, to darker times? Well, yes, very dark times. But I was in Cardiff on Friday and you could see ahead of this, you could see the precautions. This is preparing for the football. Yes, for the, for the soccer. And um, already you could see Cardiff being in a state of lockdown, you know, and... Uh, Obviously, this will exacerbate that and it will be, uh, well, Cardiff will become, well, a ring of steel. That's what, they, that's what they're saying and I'm sure it will be. Now, this will, this will necessitate that. It's very difficult, though, to protect against the sort of random outrage that we've seen last night. You can't, can you? You can't. You can't. I mean, look, the, the, the point, what, what seems to be emerging from this story is that the attack didn't take place within the inner cordon of the arena. It appeared to be at the outside edge yes, where yes. many of the families were waiting for the children to come yes. out. So you can see that the, uh, the, the, the terrorist or whoever the individual was has targeted a waiting area rather than the main area because yeah, they knew that that's where people would be congregating. It's a change in tactic. And, and this is the point. You, we can try and protect the public as much as possible. But, you know, if we're to continue to live a free life in the UK, then um, it becomes very difficult to protect Absolutely. people everywhere all of the time. I think it might be a moment to hear from the, the mayor of Manchester, talk about civic leaders. I will, um, I, I will um, ensure that the people of Greater Manchester have confidence in what we are doing as, uh, as leaders of the city region, myself and Sir Richard Lees, working with the police, the NHS and the other emergency services. You know, we have, all of us, uh, long experience in, in, in politics. We, we, um, uh, we, we will work closely to ensure that Greater Manchester pulls together uh, and and gets gets things right and gives confidence back to the public. But I, I would also say, you know, we want to to bring this city region back together. And I would urge people to uh, to to show their their support by possibly attending the vigil uh, tonight. The the most important message we must all send together is that we are united and we will not let them win. Mm. Speech you must never have wanted to have to make, but spoke well. 
Yeah, he, he must emphasise with him to a certain extent. It's a horrible situation to be yeah, in. Yeah, I think the, the reality of, uh, of modern life is that the events that happened in Manchester could have happened anywhere in the UK, could have happened anywhere in Europe. Um, and, you know, whilst the security services do an enormously important job to try and keep people safe, there is always that lone person that will mm. slip through or a person who's determined enough. So, um, as Andy was saying then, I, I met him a few times. He's a, he's a very accomplished uh, leader. You know, we, we cannot be... Um, cowed by these people, we must continue to uh, to send the right message, which is that we are, will stand together. Uh, we're all supporting each other, and that life goes on, and that we will remember those people who unfortunately lost their lives last night. But you know, we are more determined than ever to make sure that those people don't succeed in their aims. I wonder, does it make young people? A little bit more fearful of, of being out and about, or, or... I, th I think so, massively. It's uh, you know, it's been documented today that this is the biggest attack on British soil since the 7-7 bombings. Obviously, we remember in the tube stations, and it is that kind of, I don't think there's ever this point now where we've felt safe in the UK, in Europe, in the world, really, since that these major terrorist attacks have kind of started popping up. But like Robert said, and you've said, this isn't something new, is it? This well, isn't... no, it's not something new. And of course, what is new, we lived through, all of us mm -hmm. lived through the IRA bombings. <clears throat> But of course, we are dealing with a different entity here. We are dealing with people who are not prepared to give a warning that there's a bomb being placed and cause disruption of that kind. They are prepared to go the, the whole hog and mm. blow themselves up and others as well. Now, how do you, let, how do you pre prevent that? And it that? was fairly clear, wasn't it, what the IRA wanted? Yeah, I mean, look, what we, again, it's a, it's a fractured uh, position at the moment. There isn't a single enemy uh, really out there. There are organisations that try and uh, radicalise people. There are... Then, ISIS have claimed responsibility. Yeah, and, and of course there are individuals who are not associated formally, mm -hmm. but who may be radicalised anyway or may have old views and, and take up arms to do things like this. So it's mm -hmm. a very, very difficult situation. And, and again, you know, we've, we've, we've got a very, very... Um, good security services in the UK, but even they cannot s uh, stop every attack because it's impossible to keep everybody safe everywhere. And it's the scale and numbers of people who get together. I think the next venue, mm. if, if this tour mm. hadn't been cancelled, would have been the O2 Arena. Was that 18,000 people? Uh, yeah, up to, up to 20, yeah. Mm. But obviously the Manchester Arena is, I think, the, the biggest or second biggest arena in Europe. So, you know, it's... Uh... But, you know, I was coming over this morning... Uh, from Port Albert to the studio. And I was thinking to myself as I was looking down the Swansea docks, the older people of your city, you know, they have they remember terrorism on, oh, yeah. on, a, on a far bigger mm. scale than this and how they survived and lived through it. And I think perhaps in the DNA of their, their, their children and grandchildren, there is this, you know, there, there, there's this resilience you know, yes. they're not going to be, they're right. not going to be cowed, they're not going to be terrified by by what happens. No. And I, I mean, you think of what Swansea went Swansea through. Swansea was raised, wasn't it? Yes, was yes a, you know, maybe. during the war. I, but well, again, you know, that spirit has come through in what the stories yes. we've been hearing coming out yes. from Manchester yes. last night where, you know, people like taxi drivers and others were running to people's assistance. Mm -hmm. People were taking people into their homes for safety. Uh, and, you know, they were helping uh, children find their parents and stuff. So, you know, I think that community st spirit is, is alive and well and, and I'm, I'm pleased to see it. But, you know, terrible events yesterday and uh, I really hope they never uh, re get repeated in any part of the UK. Andy Burnham said a couple of times this morning when being interviewed, it's got to be business as usual in Manchester, as far as it can be. How important is that resilience of the UK and for us all, I, I, again, Europe and the world to stand up and go, this isn't going to stop us in our tracks. We've got to carry on and be you know, no, brave. And, and that is the message here too. You know, um, we, we get on with the day-to-day the, the -day business, the, the life that we lead, and we, we do the jobs that we're here to do. And um, whilst we pay respects and we remember those and we will remember them tonight at, at the vigil again. The flags of the Guild Hall and the Civic are flying at half mast in respect as well. But, you know, people are getting on with their daily jobs and that's the right way to respond to this. Uh, you know, you, you cannot let people who are radicalised in this way um, change the way that we live our lives. Mm. And yet we have to change a little bit, possibly. Perhaps we have to be more observant, more vigilant ourselves. Well, that's one of the ways, obviously, that people can help is, you know, 
be vigilant, uh, be observant, and if they see something suspicious or out of the ordinary, then report it. It's better to report it and be wrong than, than not report it and obviously um, find uh, an event like this happening. Thank you. I'm sure we'll be talking about this again uh, later. Yeah, next we are going to carry on talking about the attack in Manchester. We're going to be looking at the effects it's had on the rest of the country. See you later. After the break.
Welcome back to Today on Bay TV. I'm Gaynor Morgan. With me is Henry Darby Cook and also Robert Stewart. Rob Stewart, the leader of Swansea Council, and Robert Llewellyn Jones is with us for a very different programme this morning, Henry, as we reflect on the events in Manchester. We do, yeah. Rob, Swansea and the surrounding areas have got a very busy summer of events coming up. Does this change plans? Is this something that will maybe be refocused and... Well, again, we'll be uh, looking at what happened in Manchester and we'll be reviewing security around the major events that we'll be holding because Swansea is a large city. Uh, you know, we will have a programme of events over the summer. Um, we've got to take that, uh, uh, obviously, in the Liberty Stadium in a few weeks' time. Um, as with any large city events, we always review security ahead of that time and we'll be working with the police and others to make sure that any lessons that could be learned from Manchester will be will be learned ahead of those events. But uh, again, you know, I can't re-emphasise the point, you know, major events, um, they are a gathering of people and, and we what we know from what individuals and radicalised people have done in the past is they changed their tactics when the security cordons have changed. So you can never say never, but you know, we'll do our best to make sure that we have as good a security as we could possibly have around any events in the city. Might be appropriate now to hear from the police in, in Manchester. This has been the most horrific incident we have ever faced here in Greater Manchester and one that we all hoped we would never see. Families and many young people were out to enjoy a concert at the Manchester Arena and have very sadly lost their lives. Our thoughts are with those 22 victims that we now know have died, the 59 people who have been injured and their loved ones. We continue to do all we can to support them and they are being treated at eight hospitals across Greater Manchester. We have been treating this as a terrorist incident and we believe at this stage the attack last night was conducted by one man. The priority is to establish whether he was acting alone or as part of a network. The attacker, I can confirm, died at the arena. We believe the attacker was carrying an improvised explosive device which he detonated, causing this atrocity. We would ask people not to speculate on his details or share names. This is a complex and wide-ranging investigation. Our priority is to work with the National Counter-Terrorist Policing Network and UK Intelligence Services to establish more details about the individual who carried out this attack. Can you tell us the age range of the victims and whether or not they've all been identified? Um, obviously at this stage uh, I can't give that sort of level of detail, but what I can confirm is that there are children. Very measured statement, Rob. I think the word complex uh, is really what you've been alluding to. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's, not, a, it's not a straightforward picture at all. And, uh, you know, as we said before the break, um, there are numerous people out there who... Uh, it's a fractured terrorist network. It's a fractured position in terms of there isn't one clear enemy that we, we, we understand. Um, and there are people known to the security service who could be a threat. There are... Surely those people who are not known to the security services who may also pose a similar threat. And that's, I think that's what recent events, certainly with um, the events outside Parliament uh, in recent months, where the, the, you know, the car driver and the, the knife attack, uh, and then you know, the events in Europe. We, we don't really uh, seem to have a clear picture where the next attack could come from. Everything's changed, Robert. You and I grew up in a, <laughs> a fairly... Well, I, I always felt safe. I was born post-war. You were a little bit older than me. Um, but it was safe, wasn't it? Well, we didn't have... Um, I was brought up in Merthyr Tidville where Mrs Chang kept the Chinese restaurant and uh, the Chinese laundry and her daughter was in school with us. Um, we had a, the, the second largest Jewish community in Wales and there was one old gentleman who we refer to as Harry the Black and a former colleague of ours at the Western Mail uh, wrote a poem about him which is in an anthology of Welsh verse. He wasn't black at all, he was Maltese but we <laughs> didn't know this you know because we we were not part, we didn't have these different nationalities uh, like we have now. But I was going to ask you as a local, pol as a politician, as a local uh, government uh, official are you party to the, whether you have to sign the Official Secrets Act or, or whatever, to the intelligence communities uh, 
information? No, not, not, to, not to a great degree. No. Obviously, if there is a specific threat to Swansea, there is a command structure within Swansea which uh, senior officials of the council will be involved in. Um, and again, where we get, get things like royal visits, you know, that, that structure comes together. But, you know, um, where there is a specific threat to Swansea, which there isn't at the present time, um, then we'll be alerted. I think it might be a, a good point to hear from the, the Home Secretary. I know that some people will only just be waking up to the news of the horrific attacks in Manchester last night. This was a barbaric attack, deliberately targeting some of the most vulnerable in our society, young people, children, out at a pop concert. My thoughts and prayers go out to the families, the victims who've been affected. And I know the whole country will share that view. I'd like to pay tribute to the emergency services who've worked throughout the night professionally and effectively. They've done an excellent job. Later on this morning, I will be attending COBRA, chaired by the Prime Minister, to collect more information, to find out more about this particular attack. And I can't comment any more on that at the moment. The public should remain alert, but not alarmed. And if they have anything to report, they should approach the police. But I have two further things to add. The great city of Manchester has been affected by terrorism before. Its spirit was not bowed, its community continued. This time, it has been a particular attack on the most vulnerable in our society. Its intention was to sow fear, its intention is to divide, but it will not succeed. The Home Secretary touched on, on young people, and it's very pertinent, isn't it? How, how, how do we explain all this? Thing? Well, you know, it's, 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 you can't even begin to understand how somebody would think to do something like this. I mean, it, 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 as the Home Secretary said, it was a clear attack on young people, children, um, people who'd been at a pop concert. It was, it, we understand the bomb was detonated in a public area, not even inside the arena, where families would have been greeting their children. You know, this was clearly... Uh, Excitement, uh, the euphoria, it, buying it was, the memorabilia. It was aimed at creating the most disruption and damage and loss of life that possible. Yeah, so how, how do you warn people? She, she was saying there, you know, be alert but not alarmed. How do you warn young people without taking away their sense of adventure and excitement in life? I think I think it's very difficult. I mean, look, you know, I'm, I'm sure like you all, we've we've travelled on the underground in London, and you know, you, where you've got thousands and millions of people were moving through uh, congested areas. Or mm. most people will be going there with some sort of bag. Mm. You know, it's very difficult to try and spot um, anybody who could be a threat. But you know, there are those individuals who will give away certain signs. That you know, the the police and security service do screen people to to try and identify the threats. And we've got to rely on them to do as good a job as they possibly can to keep us safe. I'm wondering about the role of, of social media, mm. Facebook, Twitter. Henry, you'd be more across all that. Yeah, I think, you know, it's still a big problem. We've been speaking about it this week in relation to politics. But actually, you know, there's this rawness, I think, this morning. Most people who open their phone on a morning without actually looking for this news, you've been greeted by it on Twitter or Facebook via, you know, viral videos that are going on and stuff. And it's... Uh, I did, we spoke about it in the break of this, the desensitisation of it, because it's just the norm now, which is very sad. We've got a great clip, actually, kind of looking at uh, the reaction on social media this morning. Oh, my God. After the concert, as soon as Ariana left the stage, it was these massive explosions. <laughs> and everyone started to run. Powerful stuff there, and obviously it can't be policed. It can't be controlled. Well, one of the interesting things that struck me was um, 
Back quickly. Police presence. There were no armed police there. So they had... In... Another question to be considered, I think, probably, Rob. Yeah. Thank, thank you both so much for coming in. And to keep up to date with the awful events still unfolding in Manchester, check Bay TV's Twitter feed. Next, we're going to be inviting Sam Blackstone to the sofa. We're going to be talking voting registrations and everything in between.
Welcome back to Today on Bay TV. I'm Henry Darby Cook. This is Gary Morgan. We're Robert Llewellyn Jones are still with us, and we're joined by our resident politics guru, Sam Blackson. Is that a fair that. title now? Yeah, I'll take that. That's fine. <laughs> so obviously, we're talking about Manchester yeah. and the uh, awful events that have happened there overnight. But this isn't the first time uh, an event like this has stopped uh, kind of the election process. Well, I was reading this morning, I forgot actually that uh, a couple of days into the 1979 campaign, there was an incident where Airy Neve, who was one of uh, Mrs Thatcher's very, very close allies, was, was blown up, um, or his car was blown up and he was killed. Uh, coming out of the, the House of Commons, and that was, that was during an election campaign. Nothing of this scale. Uh, this scale is definitely unprecedented, which, um, which makes it very significant. And of course, Profoundly the, shocking at the time. Uh, profoundly shocking at the time, but I think, like Robert was saying uh, um, in, the last, in the last half, um, IRA activity was, for many people, a, a, a general feature of, of life. Um, pe people knew about it, they, they worried about it, it happened, and indeed, like you were saying too, people got on with things as well. It was something that, um, that, that, that you coped with. Of course, this is of a different type. This, this violence is less overtly political, I suppose. And, it, and the fact that it targeted children, I think, in, in time will be, the, will be the big uh, defining feature of it. But no, you know, violence as part of political campaigns, violence as part of uh, political acts. I mean, the very famous one being the, the, the Brighton bomb, the, the Grand Hotel in Brighton being bombed. Uh, the, the day I wasn't in, supposed in, to see. In 1984, Thatcher, absolutely, famously. yes. Yeah. And indeed, the kind of rhetoric that she put out after that. Extraordinary, um, really. Well, I mean, I, I, again, I watched that speech um, this morning again, and, and, and I, I thought, I, you know, th th there are echoes of that coming through as well. The, the, the tone of politics um, changes with these kind of things. It'll be interesting to see how the tone remains changed, perhaps, in the next couple of weeks as absolutely, a result of, 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 what's, of what's happened. Yes. Mm. Yes, and, of course, the restriction on being able to comment on the election, and rightly so, uh, perhaps, but... The motive for all this, to me, doesn't seem to be political. Mm, yeah. it's, it's, it goes far deeper than politics. Mm. And, of course, that's where the, the difficulty for me lies, is how do you, how do you reconcile you know, this, this incident now with, with any kind of logical or uh, rational behaviour. There is no rational behaviour involved here, is there? I think some of the points that you and, and, and Rob earlier made about not being able to determine any of these kind of things, not being able to plan for them, because they are fundamentally sporadic yes. and random, yes, is, is, is right. And it's about striking that balance, isn't it, between mm. um, not infringing too much on people's liberties by um, clamping down on what they can do, where they can go, mm. what they can see, and trying to protect people. I wouldn't want to be in that decision to, to try and no. make, make, make those... And, and while make, we don't want to touch on decisions. politics per No, but say... I was going to make the point, Gainer, about the coming back to... Uh, uh, Fringing upon freedom, you know, it's a terrifying thing. Not a terrifying. You, I suppose, you grow used to it after a while. But to see an armed policeman, mm -hmm. you know, one carrying a, a gun, mm -hmm. and you think to yourself, you know, well, that's New York, perhaps, but it's. You know, it's not this country, but no. it's coming to that, isn't it? It is. Well, and it's now the norm to yeah. see that at the, the Swans game. And, and what yeah. if last night there was this man who had obviously uh, planned on planting a bomb and blowing himself up and others as well? What would have happened if that man had been dete detected and shot? Mm -hmm. Like the poor guy on the London tube was, and he mm -hmm. didn't have a bomb with him. But you remember there was a hue and cry and about the shoot-to-kill policy by the police and goodness knows what. Well, I'm afraid that's going to be something that will be explored, I think, over the next few weeks. That's... Interesting times. Yes. Perhaps we could turn to some of the, the nuts and bolts, really, yes. of, of the election process. Yeah. And there's been this issue about engaging young people, hasn't there? And I think, um, was the online registration finishing last night? It closed last night, 11.59. Mm. Yes. Uh, there was a surge of about, apparently 90,000 under-24s registered yesterday. Supposedly, yes. Um, very interesting. It'll be, and it'll be interesting to see if that has any effect uh, in the long term. Yes, I mean, I, uh, I, it, it's been interesting to see that um, social media, in particular, has been very much driving this cause and, and, and you know, really trying to encourage young people uh, to vote for various kinds of reasons. And there are political reasons for trying to get young you, people you to vote. There are practical media, reasons. But there's somebody using the social media. So mm -hmm. who, it's who's... certain people on. The, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's certain groups within that, and I wonder whether 
they are they're trying to pull young people in because they think young people will be advantageous to uh, to, 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 the, to the results. Or um, and then th there are people obviously who think this is part of making the democratic process healthier. I think it's very interesting about young people. I um, worked very briefly in the Welsh Assembly um, a couple of years ago now, and they were having a debate there about uh, uh, should 16-year-olds be given the vote. And I was really impressed with um, this group of 16-year-olds who came and tried to say, you know, w w we're politically engaged, we deserve the vote, and I actually ended up um, ghostwriting a speech for one of the members down there. But it did also make me think that, on the other hand, these were a small, a relative, well, a very small They're group of 16, small. of course, and, and articulate uh, and, and very well-informed 16-year-olds will make the headlines, but are they representative of all, uh, all young people? And I think that the reason why you see such low turnout figures for um, that young demographic is young people, historically, but also in the contemporary context, aren't as interested in politics. They've got other yeah. things to think but about. You, you, you touched on social media. I think it was Spencer Feeney, the former editor of the Evening Post, said uh, here yesterday, was it, yes. um, that perhaps if we could vote through Facebook or vote on social media, mm -hmm. more people, more young people would vote. In practical terms, that's not possible, is it? But has he got a, something of a point there? Well, he might have a point because people use these these devices quite glibly in, in, in many ways. Uh, it's a little bit like when I was last on, we were talking about online voting, and I said at the time, I just don't see any practical way in which it would work. Uh, and yet we do almost everything else online. I know, I mean, I, I, there's, there's the old fashioned allure of going to the ballot box as well, isn't there? But there's also, you know, so many online things are, c can be hacked, uh, they, 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 they can be subject to uh, people um, misusing them. So I think, you know, and if, yet our if, bank accounts? Well, well which, the which, which, vote, which are, are the postal uh, vote a form of online? You have to uh, register for it online, well, don't you? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. But you vote. Uh, or you, you, know, point you, is you don't have to go to the polling station. Exactly. Yes, yes. Oh, no, indeed. I'm, not saying it's, I'm not saying it's purely about going to the no. polling station. I'm just saying that you mentioned online banking, which is meant to be secure. It's very often not secure. Mm. There are, there, there, there and are, yet we have can, to live with it, because we, we, that's the modern we do, world. We, we, we do have to live with it. But what if there was some uh, unresolved issue about uh, a certain vote in a certain constituency because something had been, something had been hacked uh, and, and, and there was uncertainties about those? Well, I think, look, at, look at the United States election. What about it? Well, there was all <laughs> sorts of uh, talk about the Russians hacking the... Well, yeah, which, which, which to me is an argument for, uh, for pulling it back to as, kind of as, 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 as basic as Sometimes possible. Sometimes you can't stop the tide. Can you? No, you, you can't. have to get people to vote. And people were apparently registered in multiple states and mm. were travelling to... Well, I'm, I'm registered yeah. twice in, in, in places for, for this election because I've, I've, I've moved house, but I've, I've got two polling cards. Obviously, I will only vote in one place because that's the law. Mm. But, but, you, but it is possible to vote in, in, in more than one place, which is very uh, 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Do you think that online voting would encourage younger people to, to vote more? Uh, it, you know, it's a concept that sounds good. I don't think it would ever exist because it can't be p policed correctly. And that's kind of, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, it sounds great, but I don't think it would ever happen. But bringing it back to the registration, I think from when the snap election was uh, announced, mm. they're, they're saying two million new people have registered to vote. Apparently so. But seven million people still are unregistered. Yeah. So we've got... That's extraordinary. Some good, but obviously yeah. then some bad. So yeah. there's progression, but still not enough. Indeed. And there are, in some seats that are very marginal, it'll be those kind of people who are not voting that could be swinging the results. So mm -hmm. uh, it matters. But to my mind, I don't know what you think about this, Robert. If you, if you haven't registered to vote and you're not particularly interested, then you're obviously not part, uh, interesting part, taking part of the no. process uh, well, um, well, on the whole. Uh, that's true. But I was going to ask you, how, how, do, you, how do you think you could attract young people to vote? How, how, how could you get them to say, now look, this is, this is important, this is a, something, this is a, your democratic mm -hmm. right, go out and exercise it. How, yeah. how would you do that? I was asked this by the BBC the other day, and, I, and, <laughs> and what, I, what I said to them is what I'd say to you is, I'm, I'm luckily not being the policymaker, I'm not sure. Uh, I think uh, it's about um, giving uh, attractive policies. And, and when you look at um, ish, d debates around, for example, tuition fees, uh, that are, they, those are things that tangibly affect young people. But I think the main thing is, now more than ever, young people are in worlds that don't particularly involve politics. Back in the day when not many people went to university, they left school early, you, you entered into a world of work, of taxation, mm -hmm. of uh, trade union politics, for example. Politics mattered to you, the political mattered to you. Now, uh, you, I, I think young people, a little bit like me, 
live in a bubble for longer, where politics and uh, real decisions and the real they world They do matter, doesn't. but they don't appear to matter. Well, they, it's a perception, yeah, I think it is a perception thing as well, uh, absolutely. And, and it, yes, things don't appear to matter as much as they obviously do to them. But they, but, you know, why, why do most people vote? It's often for uh, the amount of tax they'll pay. And young people, if they're not paying tax, um, won't be thinking about those things as much as people who are, for example, in the, think, in, in the uh, world of work. I think we'll have to bring it to a close. Interesting debate, and I'm sure we'll pick up on it again. On this dreadful day. Henry's going to be doing a runner after the break and I'll be joined by Kirsten Osborne. So, see you we'll then. We'll see you then. recorded earlier.
Welcome back to the final part of Today on Bay TV. I'm Gaynor Morgan and I've been joined by Kirsten Osborne. Kirsten, you've brought a friend with you. I have. Um, today I've brought my friend Steve Sachs. Um, we've got um, a single being released on Friday, which has come around really quick, hasn't it? It has, yeah. <laughs> Very quick. <laughs> really exciting. Now, um, you generally a uh, star on your own, aren't you? Yeah. So yeah. What, what's happened? Um, well, just last year, was it? I think, I think um, it was about a year ago, yeah. About a year ago we came together and um, I've always wanted to perform with a band. It's been like a dream of mine. So we came together and uh, now he's like my sidekick and he performs with me everywhere and playing his sax. And um, yeah, lots of people are enjoying our performances and things. So um, I've been in the studio recently and I thought something's missing off this track. <laughs> and, a um, man. <laughs> I realised who it was. It was Steve. <laughs> now you're well known as being a, the, the Forces sweetheart and you're off to the Falklands in September. But before, before we, we touch on all that, mm -hmm. tell me a bit more about this single. Yes, um, it's called Songbird. So it's the original song that everybody knows by Eva Cassidy and Fleetwood Mac. Um, but I wanted to make it a little bit different, add my own touch to it. Um, so we've kind of stripped back the song, added, you know, just piano, guitar, and then, like I said, something was missing. So um, that's when we called upon Steve. So, so what did you I, I had Steve? the phone call, so, uh, well, I, I was very, very pleased to play on it. It's such a beautiful song. Kirsten sings it so well, and she uh, asked me if I wanted to, uh, I think it was the night before, wasn't it? Yeah, We need a sax. <laughs> I think I was playing with you somewhere in uh, the yeah. golf club, wasn't it? So, yeah, we I were in know. an event, weren't we? What are you doing tomorrow? I said nothing, right. <laughs> <laughs> Come and play a saxophone solo on this, so. Uh, and that was um, that Friday. But to be honest, it's, uh, it's come out really well. It's, it has. Uh, We've had a lot of good feedback so far. Um, and then next Friday, there's going to be a video released on YouTube. So for everyone to keep their eyes peeled, that's going to be coming out. And then the album, which is called Songbird, will be released at the end of June. So that's going to be available on iTunes, Amazon and all online stores. So and is that all involving you, Steve? Um, well, the, yeah. the single, yeah, it's Best all. Um, I, 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 <laughs> yeah. I do a lot more work with uh, with with uh, Kirsten at the minute, um, and um, enjoying every moment. It's uh, yeah. it's it's a good uh, it's, it's good duo, like you know. Yeah. I think it works there's, well. There's a couple of surprises on the album of um, a few songs where Steve makes a little appearance. Yeah. You? <laughs> I think all the best things are done on impulse, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, it it's is definitely, definitely impulse. It's been a surprise. <laughs> You've obviously risen to the challenge. So yes, that's right. definitely. That's a very busy year for you, Kirsten, isn't it? Oh, yes. You're um, busy preparing for the Falklands? Yes, it's going to be a big trip. Um, and the run-up to the to the day when I'll be flying, um, I'm trying to raise lots of funds for, fundraising? for the Falklands veterans, um, which all the money of the charity events that are coming up are going to go to Sama Wales, which is a charity based on supporting the Welsh veterans of the Falklands War. Um, and also be supporting the Liberty Lodge, which is um, a lodge where you can go to stay in the Falklands to visit the soldiers serving, uh, where veterans can stay and revisit the island. So um, I've got a big event on the 28th of July, which is in Neath Rugby Club. Um, it's a lovely dinner dance, so it's an excuse to dress up nice as well. <laughs> You're always dressed up nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, that's going to be a nice event, so it'd be lovely to see everybody there. Um, I'll be visiting the Tower of London, on the 9th of June, which is the changing of the keys. Um, so there's lots of different things happening throughout the year now, especially a lot seems to be happening in June. <laughs> June and July. Um, but all the events and things will be up on my Facebook and I can share them to Bay TV. Um, so if anybody wants to get involved and come along with us, that'll be fantastic. Yeah, the more the support, how the much, better. How much money are you hoping to, to raise? Um, as much as possible, to be honest. Um, you haven't it's, quite got a target. No, just... but it's, it's just as much as I possibly can, just to try and support the veterans as much as I can. Um, and I'll also be filming whilst I'm out in the Falklands um, to chat to the families that are living on the island and just to find out what life is like in the Falklands, you know, today compared to years ago during the war. Um, so it's going to be really interesting and fingers crossed everything will... Uh, will you be there for Liberation Day? Uh, no, Liberation Day, I will be in an event um, in St Mary's Church. They've got um, a service going on uh, remembering the Falklands War. So, yeah, I'll be there. So, um, again, if anybody wants to come along, please join us. Yeah. You'll be very much part of it. Now, how demanding is your role as, as it's the Forces Sweetheart, isn't it? Is that a, yes, a sort yeah. of UK-wide thing or a Welsh thing? Um, it's, it's been a Welsh thing so far, mm. um, but now it seems to be spreading further and further, um, especially with the trip to the Falklands. Um, I have been asked to travel further afield as well to other places, so fingers crossed, you know, mm. once the Falklands has come and gone, then I can think about going elsewhere, and I'm so happy to do so. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it a virulent connection? 
Um, yes, I suppose it is. Um, you know, I, I'm a singer which is totally different to how Vera Lynn was um, and is. But I'm so proud to be following in her footsteps and carrying on her legacy. And I've been in touch with Vera Lynn and her daughter throughout the years of my performing. Um, and we've kept in touch and kind of supported each other in everything that we do. And I'm just honoured to have her blessing, I suppose, to carry on what she's done. Oh, great yeah. news. All, all going. Yeah. Um, Steve, have you been working together a lot, just briefly? Uh, yes. Um, we, I'm a full-time musician, so um, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I travel around as well doing little bits, and uh, I, I share an interest with uh, cursing with uh, fundraising as well. Mm. And I have my own uh, fundraising, uh, Project Build Community Fundraising, and me and Kirsten are beginning to get together and do a lot for um, for my charities and hers. Uh, obviously, the, the veterans is... Uh, it's a, a charity that we both support and um, we can be rolling so, out. Uh, sorry. So just a, a very quick recap of, about the song. It's out on It's out on Friday. Um, it's available on iTunes and Amazon. So please get behind the single. Um, it really means a lot to the both of us. I think we're yeah. going to have a taste of it. <laughs> cool. Well, anyway, thank you so much. And thank thanks you. to all our guests today and for all our viewers watching us, especially those who've tuned in for our Talking Pictures afternoon matinee. Coming up next on Bay Today. It is the 1956 comedy Dry Rot starring Sid James. And with that, let's hear Kirsten, Kirsten recorded earlier. <laughs> Keep singing like 